Chief, thank you very much. We're, uh, Director Harwell has been very patient, <laughs> given up your whole day, and we're all ears. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Budget Committee, thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today about one of our most important programs. The CalFresh program plays an essential role in helping ensure the well-being of families, children, the disabled, and the elderly in the Central Valley, where income levels are low and poverty rates are high. The United States Census Bureau reports that San Joaquin Valley region has the highest percentage of residents living below the poverty line. The poverty rate in Stanislaus County in 2012 was 20.3 percent. Per capita income remains well below the median family income for California, and the unemployment rate in Stanislaus County, County currently at 12.1 percent, remains significantly above the state's average and has for several years. Access to nutritional food is important to improving the health of our children and our community. High levels of poverty in our region have had significant impact in the overall health of the adults and children who reside in Stanislaus County. Each month, individuals and families living in our community make difficult choices related to their daily living expenses. Many do not have sufficient funds to meet their basic needs and are forced to choose between food, housing, health care, and other essential items. Many suffer from food insecurity, lacking the physical and economic access to safe, affordable, and nutritious food. Food insecurity can have short and long-term effects on each person's health and well-being. The CalFresh program helps to address this need, and it is for these reasons that our agency continues to be dedicated to ensuring program access and program integrity. Today, over 91,000 individuals in Stanislaus County receive CalFresh benefits. This represents approximately 17 percent of the residents in our county. Each month, we receive over 3,100 applications issue over 13.5 million in benefits to over 43,000 households. Since the beginning of the economic decline in 2007, we have seen the number of individuals receiving benefits double in our community. As a county, we're committed to providing CalFresh benefits only to those who are eligible and have taken several steps to preserve the integrity of the CalFresh program. We take great pride in our upfront outreach and educational programs that ensure community and consumers together are aware of how to access the program, are informed about their individual rights and responsibilities, and that our employees are knowledgeable and diligent in their administration of the program. Our department focuses on several measures to preserve the integrity of the, of the CalFresh program. First, we focus on prevention. Through community education efforts, we conduct information sessions in the community, which include information about the program, program integrity efforts, the authorized usage of benefits, and how to report fraud. In addition, we provide posters about the CalFresh trafficking, including information about how to identify and report potential fraud, displaying our fraud hotline phone numbers and website information. We conduct customer education campaigns. These campaigns are focused on ensuring that our customers understand their rights and responsibilities prior to receiving benefits, and they understand accurate reporting. During the application process, both during in-person and phone interviews, we provide extensive information to each customer to assist them in knowing what they need to report when they need to report it. We have displays in our lobbies, including posters and videos that include information about reporting responsibilities, fraud prevention, fraud detection, including our fraud hotline. We do extensive amount of education for our employees. Our eligibility staff is our front, first front, for, front line of detection. They're trained in CalFresh rules, regulations, and are trained annually on fraud detection and interview techniques. Our program integrity efforts begin with each of them. At intake, staff review and verify eligibility, usually utilizing verifications provided by the customers, resolving inconsistencies, and complete applicant ease reviews. When discrepancies cannot be resolved, the case is referred to our special investigators. Once approved, eligibility staff continually review changes in household through the use of automated reports, and you've heard about many of those automated reports today, and through statewide data matches. Supervisors continually monitor the quality of work through case reviews and identify opportunities for training. You've also heard about payment accuracy rates today. 
We conduct quality control reviews on a monthly basis to ensure payment accuracy and information, and that information is utilized to address training needs. We're very proud of our current CalFresh air rate. For the past federal fiscal year, our CalFresh air rate was 1%, 1.03%. That's down from 2.2% from the prior year. We also take early fraud and ongoing fraud referrals and administrative disqualification hearings seriously. Referrals to our Special Investigations Unit are identified and generated through multiple venues, and you've heard about some of those venues from LA County. We receive referrals by our eligibility staff, from information received via the automated statewide reports, from telephone calls to our fraud hotline, and inquiries received via our agency and county websites. On average, our Special Investigations Unit receives approximately 450 monthly referrals, slightly more than 1% of our total monthly households served in the program. Fraud overpayments and issuances are identified through these referrals and they equate to approximately $152,000 monthly. Again, 1% of our CalFresh benefits issued monthly. Each month, 35 to 40 individuals are disqualified from receiving future benefits through in, uh, intentional program violation and administrative qualification hearings. In a fiscal year 2012-13, we had 14 criminal convictions. We also monitor out-of-state, out-of-county transactions and excess card replacement. And we utilize other various measures to prevent and detect CalFresh trafficking. We monitor social media. You've heard about that, particularly Cal, uh, Craigslist. We investigate trafficking alerts provided by the state and provide information to our customers and to the public to discourage CalFresh trafficking. The measures described above strongly demonstrate Stanislaus County's commitment to ensuring access and maintaining program integrity within the CalFresh program through ever-evolving collaborative efforts between our county, the state, district attorneys, and other California counties. Um, if you would like, we also have other um, fraud um, statistics that we can provide. Dr. Thank Harwell, you. thank you very much for giving us your day and for the information you provided. And I know that your county struggles in ways that other counties in California are not currently, so you've got your hands full. You had mentioned that the poverty rate is somewhere between 20 21 percent. About 17 percent of your residents are participants in CalFresh, so you've got a good number of people who are at poverty or below who aren't participating, but then I would imagine there are some who are possibly a little above poverty who are also not. Do you know what the eligible percentage rate is in your county if we're 55 statewide? We're at 75 percent. 75 percent. We're 11. We're, we rank 11th in um, CalFresh participation, but we continue to still have a lot more outreach to do in our community and we're targeting specific populations. Um, Mr. Lightborn addressed, uh, and I, Mr. Bland had talked about the CalFresh outreach plans that we've developed, in, uh, each county has submitted, and we continue to operate that. We're working very closely with our community-based organizations and different partnerships to look at how we bring more individuals who are eligible to the program um, have them have access to the program. The one percent number you use that is with air, with right. regard to error rate. Yes. Well, congratulations. Well, one percent. Yeah, one percent error rate. Air so rate Ninety-nine so. percent accuracy. That's quite astounding. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you do better? <laughs> <laughs> Some think we should. <laughs> and do you experience any frustration in lack of resources, lack of intent, or any other? category with regard to ensuring program integrity? You know, I, I think we can always use additional resources. Each and every day we struggle to balance, to provide access to individuals who are applying for, ben for CalFresh benefits, to process their applications timely, to get them the uh, expedited services they need, as well as to do all the program integrity efforts that we have. So every day there's a balance as a, as a director. We're always making those choices. Um, we look at, um, we have some performance measures that we watch very closely in our county and we look at the amount of um, program allocation dollars that we allocate to both program integrity as well as um, our eligibility workers, so our special investigations unit. We believe in Stanislaw County that program integrity is a responsibility of every employee um, and so we're committed to that, but constantly we are balancing. 
From what you've heard today, given that you're 75 percent of those eligible in your county who are participating, or 55 percent statewide, any suggestions to other counties that aren't quite at your participation level? Do you know what you're doing so successfully that other counties may not? I mean, the, we've, we've heard about the stigma, the onerous application process, all those things are the same throughout the state. How is it that you surmount some of those? You know, I think we've, sh we've shared and benefited a lot from best practices that other counties have learned. So we're constantly looking and comparing and finding out more information. We've done a lot of outreach. We've benefited from some outreach grants that have assisted us. Um, and in addition, um, we work very closely and collaboratively with our community-based organizations, and that's helped us uh, in a great amount of getting the word out about the program and getting access to the program. So I think each and every day we're looking for new methods. We're identifying new um, and new customers to talk with. Um, the ability to um, um, look at existing customers in our caseload, like our Medi-Cal eligibles, and do some in-reach has been an important part of what we're doing. And we know that through the Affordable Care Act, um, that's going to open up additional doors to do this. It's quite possible. You're just really good at what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have much. wonderful, dedicated staff. Senators, any questions for Director Harwell? Well, thank you all very much. I know you gave up an entire day to be with us, and uh, we appreciate that very much. You've provided a lot of information. I have to say that of all the oversight hearings that I've chaired in my now over 11 years in the Legislature, I've never walked away from one so reassured that we've got a program that's working really well. I, I had read that B article. I was concerned. That's why we decided to do the hearing. And you've answered, from my point of view, a lot of very important questions. And it's great to have the county perspective here as well, uh, from different kinds of counties, to understand how you do what you do and how it is that you do it so well. But as Senator Hancock said, we have a lot of challenges because we have a lot of people going hungry here in California. And I'm just going to make a final comment before we ask those who would like to speak to public comment that with all of the facts and figures and percentage numbers and all the details that we've combed through today, it's too easy to overlook the fact that we're talking about the subject of hunger. And not uncommonly, and I thank all of our committee members who have been with us today, but quite commonly, a colleague will step out of the room for 15 minutes to go get some food because we get hungry and we get hungry in a very few hours time and it's hard to do our work when we're hungry it's annoying it's painful and it's for us an inconvenience but for those who are not only experiencing that hourly inconvenience but not knowing when the next meal is coming it must be just frightful so it's an extraordinarily important program to imagine that we're keeping somewhere between 4 and 6 percent of Californians out of poverty as a result of the good job all of you are doing. I think you should all be sleeping very well at night. So again, I thank you. And Senator Huffer certainly welcome to any comments. Just before we go to public comments, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask if we could have the representative of the District Attorney's Association speak first because they have a meeting coming up imminently. I'd that, be happy to have yeah, that. Sure. If we could do that. Sure. And I'd like to just set up a few questions for um, the representative. What do they think of the current program's effectiveness? Is there anything they think the state could do better? Would it be helpful to consider having separate funding for fraud and investigations? Very good. So again, once uh, Mr. Bland and Director Lightburn, Director Spiller, thank you. Chief Fields, thank you for joining us. And again, Director Harwell, thank you as well. And all of those who took time to be with us today. So could we just see a show of hands of those who would like to speak publicly? OK, if you could keep your min uh, comments to a minute or two, that'd be great. But feel free to step forward. Sure. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sean Hoffman from the California District Attorney's Association. Uh, we appreciate you calling the hearing today to drill down a little deeper into the issue of program integrity within CalFresh. Um, 
think the question was raised by Senator Huff. What do we think about the effectiveness of the program currently and what could we be doing better? Um, you know, I think if you, if you asked our members the effectiveness question, you'd probably get 58 different answers. It varies greatly from county to county um, based largely on funding issues and collaboration between district attorney offices, uh, welfare fraud investigators, and county welfare departments. The sharing of information uh, greatly impacts, you know, the cases that we're able to prosecute. And so uh, Mr. Bland had touched on the, the delicate balance between uh, expanding access to the program for those who rely on it and uh, making sure that program integrity is, is safeguarded. Um, our membership, you know, we have some concerns about some of the uh, rollbacks of some of those safeguards over the years, getting rid of the fingerprint requirement, uh, moving to semi-annual reporting, simply because it, uh, it takes away some of the physical evidence that we can rely on when we're prosecuting these cases after they're referred from the investigators. And so, uh, you know, recognizing that balance, it's, it's, uh, it's delicate. Um, particularly the, the shift to semi-annual reporting, that's tough because not only do we have fewer reports to rely on in a year, but we're also sp spacing them out so that you know, the fraud may go unnoticed for a, a greater period of time. Um, but you know, we certainly encourage the Department of Social Services, county welfare departments to uh, continue to work collaboratively and utilize the expertise of district attorney's offices in uh, you know, helping to combat welfare fraud and look forward to continuing a dialogue with the committee. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Don't be shy. In fact, all those who would like to speak, come take a seat at the table. Chairman Leno and members, thank you so much. I'm Terry Oley from the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. I really appreciate this hearing today. It really was incredible, the amount of information that was shared and relayed um, from, from all parties. Uh, I just have two very brief points. Uh, one, I, I think I want to quote Mr. Bland when he said, we measured it and we got results. I think that was a really important point, both in terms of the inaccuracy and fraud issue that prompted the, this hearing today, as well as I think his follow-on point was that this will, data will be really key and critical to uh, improving participation rates in the state. And I just really want to um, commend the department and the counties on measuring, really putting their you know, shoulders to the wheel of measuring the inaccuracies and measuring the issues that, again, prompted this hearing and uh, dedicating resources to, to figuring that, uh, that information out. And I think that what I would recommend, and echoing my colleagues um, from the advocacy community who are up here, is that measuring those elements of participation, measuring what we're doing well as counties and as a state, uh, will really uh, set the lights for where we need to focus our resources on, on moving that needle on participation. Secondly, a big ask. Right now, as we all know, in Congress they're debating just devastating cuts to the program. That is, that is going to be devastating to families, and as we've heard today, these things are all related, and the, econ the economic impacts are huge, the human impacts are huge. The, bodies of the Assembly and the Senate have already reached out as bodies and have encouraged a no cuts um, uh, platform or message to Congress. And we would just encourage you to individually reach out for any members who could reach out to their representatives and say, please, don't cut SNAP. It's already uh, struggling in, in California. We're already struggling. And to, to make further cuts is just going to be devastating. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oli, for being here. And also, uh, thanks to the San Francisco and Marin Food Bank, which does an extraordinary job. Thank you. And as I should have said, too, that when we see cuts at SNAP, that, that immediately impacts what, the, the number of people and the demand that is put on our services. And so it is all related. So we, we absolutely see that need uh, very visibly. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Martyr, and I've been involved in investigating uh, public assistance fraud since uh, 1996. And I'd just like to make a few comments uh, about program integrity. And um, I wanted to remind the committee about the two um, state audits that were conducted, one in 1995 and one in 2009, that both indicated that um, fraud prevention efforts in, through early fraud and ongoing investigations were found to be very cost effective um, in, in maintaining program integrity and using dollars wisely. Um, 
one of the things that we've seen as uh, investigators uh, throughout the years is the number of investigators uh, within the state, uh, the numbers going down significantly. As we increase our participation rates, as we have more people uh, applying for benefits, um, the number of people tasked with program integrity has been consistently going down from approximately 1,100 investigators in the late 90s to somewhere around 500 today. And I think that's significant when we're taking a look at, at making fraud um, uh, um, prevention um, uh, applications within, within the communities and whatnot. There isn't a single investigator. You know, I think Mr. Bland said it best. It's a balancing act. And we have to balance um, our efforts of detecting fraud with the accessibility of programs and, and making those choices available to people. Um, lastly, as I, as I listened to everybody and I stayed here throughout the, the uh, meeting, I think there's very good representation. We have CDSS, obviously. We have counties and whatnot. But I think there's one critical um, element that's missing. And that is the voice of the investigators. And there is a state association that represents uh, approximately 400 of our investigators. And I would encourage the committee um, to um, uh, make contact with that organization and perhaps use us as a resource too when you're trying to determine what is effective and, and not effective uh, in regards to um, investigating uh, public assistance fraud. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Martyr. Had to have this to remind me who I was. My name is Carl Phillips. I'm the vice president of the California Welfare Fraud Investigators Association. I've been with uh, welfare fraud investigation since 1999 and 20 years as a federal investigator prior to that. <clears throat> I'm getting old. Uh, you and me both. Everybody's pretty much covered a lot of what I was going to say. Two of the biggest issues, we we're talking about the 1%, 1 to 2% um, error rate. <clears throat> Part of my staff does the early fraud investigations for, for the county, and across the board, we do roughly 300 early fraud investigations per month, and we find problems, fraud indicators or, or problems, within approximately 30 percent of those. So those action is taken on. So the fact that we have the investigators going out and doing that job drastically impacts that 1% error rate because if we didn't identify these problems, it would create errors in the future. Um, <clears throat> one other thing I was going to go over, which... And you're clearly doing a good job if our error rate's so small. But, yeah, I represent one of 58 counties. Actually, I, today I'm representing the association. But he had also addressed the fact that uh, we've gone from roughly 1,100 investigators, mainly because I maintain the directory for our association in, I think that was in 2002 or 2003, down to right around 500 investigators right now. Um, I know my staff was cut by 50% in 2003. And with the increases in, in what's going on, as far as participation rates, caseloads and everything, running, mm -hmm a caseload on 50% manpower is rough. So we would like to see increases so that we can continue to maintain program integrity. And the um, district attorney representative commented on one of the other issues that I have is a lot of the things that are brought about to increase availability to the aid that is brought about through the legislature and through rules and regulations also provide hindrances to us in, the prov in proving intentional welfare fraud. Going to a quarterly reporting system, yes, it did, uh, it did lower the error rate by reducing 67% of the paperwork required. However, that also reduced 67% of the evidence we have available to prove intentional fraud occurred. So those are a couple of things that we have to, everything that is put in to reduce their efforts in getting the aid also creates a bigger, for us, a burden in proving intentional fraud. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Mr. 
Mr. Chair, committee. Uh, my name is Guy Christian. I'm president of the California Welfare Fraud Investigators. Uh, there's been so much covered today in depth and so many numbers kicked out. Uh, program integrity units are really designed to create and manage program integrity through this system. In 1996, we saw a welfare reform that was based on a lot of complaints. That welfare reform, I don't even consider it welfare reform. It was just a change in maneuver and program, and it hurt a lot of people. But it was something that <clears throat> Congress had to do because of taxpayer pressure. It's important to maintain program integrity. The Social Services Manual establishes that program integrity units, it's recommended that we have a rate of one investigator for every thousand cash aid cases. It doesn't even address that in California, as of September, there were 1.9 million food stamp cases that were also required to manage, plus child care, plus auxiliary uh, programs. There's been a lot of numbers. You've heard them all today, but there's a form called the DPA 266 or the Fraud Activity Report. I would urge you, it's CDSS's form, go online and review that. Because for the 2003 uh, year, fiscal year 2012-2013, uh, there were 1.65 million referrals sent to program integrity units. 306,000 were all that were able to be uh, investigated. Of that amount, 116,000 plus were found to have some element of fraud. Now that's not prosecution, that could be any kind of fraud around. That's 38%. I keep hearing 1%. When I go to national committees and national meetings and I hear 1%, everyone laughs. Keep in mind, the 1% is an error rate, not the... Funding. This is fraud. Right. We just don't have enough people to do the job. We are talking program integrity here today. That's what this was supposed to be about. And in order for us to do our job, we want to be able to have the manpower. Now, our guys go out every single day, and they see poverty. And we've all talked around it today. We've all talked and been really nice, but we have not said the truth here, which is poverty stinks. It's just terrible. None of us want to see a child go without Cheerios for breakfast. None of us want to see a kid that goes to school that doesn't have a right lunch. We also, at the same time, don't want to see people who misuse the system deliberately. We have eligibility workers that work their hearts out. We have people in CDSS and state levels that work their hearts out to make this program functional for those that deserve. We strive to keep it that way. That's our job. We would ask that as you look at all these different things, you think about the investigators in the field because they're the, we're the ones climbing out of those cars and we're the ones that are looking in those faces every day. We also have to answer those questions they ask. How come it takes so long? Or what can I get? So we'd like to have the ability to be able to do that job. And right now our funding comes from counties. The county welfare director makes a determination of how much that fraud unit is gonna get. So if you work in a county where you have a county welfare director that is specifically interested in maintaining that fraud level, they're going to do it. But if they choose not to, the SIU suffers. We need to make a program to where SIUs are the same throughout California, where in Mendocino County, it's done the same as it is in San Diego County. And reporting statistics are reported the same throughout the state. We would hope you take that into consideration. We want the assistance to go to the people that need it. That's where it needs to be. And every time we see a headline, so-and-so committed food stamp fraud, it hurts every person on assistance. It hurts every person who works within this system, whether you're an eligibility worker or whether you're somebody writing policy in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Christian. Anyone else interested in public comment? Mr. Leno and Mr. Huff uh, and members of the committee, Mike Carroll with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. And I, I just feel compelled to just add one fact here to the last several of the speakers. Um, uh, I don't doubt their data is right. They probably have less welfare fraud investigators than we did 
um, previously. Um, but it's also a fact that we have less people on CalWORKs than we used to 20 years ago and 15 years ago. Um, the decline in the number of investigators rather shock strikingly corresponds with a 50% cut that we've seen in the caseload from 1998 until about 2003. So um, I just think that's an important consideration and that county welfare directors have to make the difficult choice also of how to provide the sufficient services, child care, welfare to work opportunities that allow people to get off of assistance so that they can fend for themselves and not have to rely on government assistance. And I think those are the difficult choices that counties have had to make. And so I think you, it's not surprising that as caseload goes down and counties have to make those choices, that we're seeing less, some cases, less money going into those fraud investigation units. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harold. Mr. Mecker, you're going to get the last word. Thank you, Mr. Leno. The, I, I represent the county human service directors that employ uh, fraud investigators. Um, or who contract with district attorneys who employ. Um, but the function is done um, under the direction of the people that I represent, and they're very proud of their fraud investigators. Um, we're very proud of our eligibility workers. And if they were here, they would tell you that they've been cut, and if there were more of them, they could do more work. The social workers who work on child abuse and neglect would tell you the same thing. Um, you, you're, in the Budget Committee, it seems that's been your job for the last decade, is to listen to very excellent public servants who are telling you that they could do more um, with more funding. And I, I, I think that is the case. But I, I think it's important that we look at some metrics to the outcomes that we're achieving or whatever standards there are for what appropriate staffing levels are. And the only one that exists in this area is a, a recommended guideline. It's been in regulations for a long time. It's not a mandate. But there'd be one investigator for every 1,000 CalWORKs cases. In fact, it was originally promulgated when it was AFDC. Um, if you run the numbers, the number of fraud investigators that was pointed out by a previous witness is sort of right in line with the recommended standard that's in regulations, and I think it's come down, as Mr. Harold pointed out, in direct relationship to the decline in the CalWORKs caseload. Um, we, you know, we've got funding challenges across our departments, and um, we're here before you year after year after year on behalf of all of these programs um, asking for adequate funding, but I just thought that that perspective um, was important as we look at what ought to be the appropriate funding levels for all the different functions within our agencies. Thank you, Mr. Mecca. Seeing no more public comment, we'll turn to Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you for um, holding this hearing today. Uh, certainly, I found it very informational. I think it is one of the better informational hearings. I, I admit it was a little frustrated. We didn't have um, some of the dissenting voice at the table as articulated by the investigators that missing the voice of 400 investigators that are going out and, and looking at this stuff all the time. Um, but having said that, I'm encouraged by some of the things I heard and some of the practices that are in place. Can we do better? I think we can always do better. Uh, you know, and it is a balancing act, as we talked about, of not suppressing people legitimately or in need and could use it versus those that are gaming the system. And I think it irritates all of us when someone games the system for their own game because when that becomes a public thing, it discourages everybody, those of us that are, are paying those precious tax dollars sometimes, particularly during recession when the need for government programs is even higher, uh, everybody's sacrificing there. So when somebody's gaming it, that's a problem. So to the point of a 1%, that's an estimated national average. So we interpolated the data and said, well, if you took 1% of California, that'd be about $70 million. And I think the chairman made a comment in a $7 billion program, but I would stipulate that Seventy million dollars is still forty-seven million meals, and that's a lot of mouths. That's a lot of people that are not getting something because there's fraud. So I applaud the stated goal of zero percent of fraud. How do we get to that? We we heard um, things the DA Association saying that taking away some of the tools was problematic for them for enforcement, uh, going from quarterly reporting to semi-annual reporting. Uh, that's something we could certainly look at reinstating. Uh, taking away fingerprinting was a little bit of a problematic, um, and maybe it's something we should look at. Um, 
And it seems like the investigations that are going on are reactive, they're passive. It's, I, I like the fact that there is a hotline that people can call anonymously and put that in, but it seems like that's mostly just reacting to it rather than, you know, if you have an auditor come and do your firm, they're gonna go and randomly check and maybe there ought to be some random checks or something. And, and if we had some more of the investigators at the table or even we enter a dialogue after the public hearing, we might find some ways that they have some suggestions of how we can more proactively make sure that uh, people are not gaming the system. So the benefits that are there, and I think we all agree, we can pull down more federal money, but this is not unlimited money. There's a finite amount of money because certainly the nation's uh, we got a little bit of debt itself. They just happen to have a printing press, which we don't have. Um, but <clears throat> I think that uh, when you, it, there was a comment about the caseload well, going down. Actually, from this, it was part of the handout from CalFresh from 2007 till now, California is over 200% increased. And yet, from 2002 or three to now, we've cut our number of investigators by half, according to one testimony. Uh, 1,100 down to 500. So I guess one of my takeaways from this is you can reduce the error rate by not looking for the errors, and that seems to be where we are. I appreciate the hearing we had, but we had a focused voice of those that are implementing the program. We didn't really have at the table those who are trying to implement and look at the fraud, and I was disappointed we didn't have much of that, but I do appreciate the hearing, and I think we learned some pretty good things today. Thank you, Senator Huff. Thank you for being here in absence of our vice chair. And just to clarify, I, unless I misunderstood, I think what we heard was the caseload for CalWORKS has gone down significantly. The caseload for CalFresh is not going down, though the increase in the expansion of the program is now beginning to fall as the economy is coming back. So I think it's all been said. Uh, it has been a very informative hearing and the delicate balance of identifying what is most effective and cost efficient in protecting the integrity of the program at the same time not exacerbating the hurdles that still keep us at the bottom of the pack among states in eligible Californians participating. We will continue to keep our eye on that but recognizing that not only are people going hungry here in the wealthiest state in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, but at the same time, we are leaving our own federal dollars in Washington when they could be here in California, generating upwards of nearly $10 billion of economic activity, creating upwards of 100,000 jobs. Those are real jobs, real money. We're leaving it behind. So we'll work together, find that delicate balance, and I thank you all for participating today. We are adjourned. <laughs>